talking um, about a little bit more of, uh, let's say, the technicalities of um, deep learning work, just to show you an example. But we're also going to connect a little bit to uh, decision making and also to sound. So uh, I hope we can draw some connections with the uh, with these the talks that we've just seen. So I'm going to be talking about birdsong and AI and how to. Uh, how, how we create high resolution birdsong representations. I'll, I'll get into the detail of that and tell you what I mean later. Um, Maria's already given an introduction. Thank you very much. So I don't need to tell you that I'm uh, at Naturalis as well as at Tilburg. Um, and also uh, highlighted the, the biodiversity issue. So this is something that the World Economic Forum um, reviewing uh, global risks has only recently put biodiversity loss into the one of the top categories along many of the other crises that we think about. But biodiversity loss is incredibly important um, economically as well as for other reasons. And if you look at this graph here, we see that farmland birds over the past uh, 30, 40 years have actually declined massively, and that's because of land use changes. So this is just one example of how at a very large scale, the whole of Europe and the whole of the world, in fact, we've got a problem to solve. But for us, and for me especially, we've got an opportunity because audio is actually the best way to monitor many of the species that we care about, birds, insects, whales, bats. These are all important uh, species for biodiversity reasons, and they also are detectable by sound. Here's a visualization. So um, this is just to give you a flavor of what data is like when you're working with sound. So we can see a spectrogram here, in fact, four spectrograms, and that shows time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis from low to high. And in the bottom left there, we have um, the song of the dawn chorus. So that's the birds singing in the morning. And so you can see there's some complexity in there. That's good news for us because there's information. There's also an increasing amount of acoustic sensing devices. So there are specific devices that people will uh, mount on a tree, leave in a forest somewhere. Also, uh, mobile phones. We can use citizen science type uh, approaches with smartphones. Warbler is an app that uh, I've been involved in over the past few years. So there's a lot of data, there's a lot of information in that data. And with my role here at Tilburg and at Naturalis, we're involved in a, a Dutch project called the Neighbor Arise project. And this is a very big project where we want to monitor all Dutch species. So we're building a big infrastructure for monitoring biodiversity in the Netherlands. But what I want to talk about today is to get into a little bit more of the technicalities of how we do that, just to show you how this works. You might have seen diagrams like this before. This shows uh, a sound file. So let's say that's a five second audio recording. It goes into deep learning uh, system, which deep learning is often multiple layers. That's what we're showing here of processing to produce some kind of class label. Now for animal sound, that might be a species label. So is it a mural or is it a roadburst? And uh, so we, this is in fact the kind of problem that most commonly is addressed in bioacoustics. Now I'm showing you this for a specific reason because when we have these layers of processing, we start with the sound and we process it until the, until the deep learning has is, and the final layer produced a species label. But in fact, we can use this for other purposes. If we take off that final layer that produces the class label, we look in there and we find that the audio has been transformed into some kind of vector coordinate. So it is a, a vector in a mathematical sense, and it's some kind of point on a map. We've turned that audio into a location. And what we can do with that then, there's a lot of information in there still, because deep learning, what, part of what's useful about deep learning is it extracts very rich representations, which, which uh, not so reductive, they contain quite a lot of uh, information. So we can take what we call the embedding. This is now a standard term that um, originated from text processing, but we, we just say embedding for one of these uh, maps that we produce using uh, deep learning or other technique. So we can use this embedding for lots of other purposes, not just the original one that we trained it for. 
So here's something, can we recognize individual birds? Uh, if you look at the screen there, can you recognize that bird? Now, I'm not actually asking if you can recognize the species, I'm asking if you can recognize the individual. Is it the same individual that came and landed on your loudspeaker yesterday? Uh, these are the kind of problems that we would like to solve because we can use that to count the population. We can, in a particular forest, for example, we can work out if, without having to disturb the animals at all, we can count the population um, pretty uh, precisely. And so there's the species level and there's the individual level. And if we think of those two categories, they form a kind of hierarchy. And so what we uh, can do and what uh, um, my uh, PhD student Inesh Nolasco is, is currently working on is using these embeddings for hierarchical classification. So that's what we're illustrating there. This shows that in this embedding space, there is a kind of semantic representation which we can use for um, high resolution analysis of animal sound. And this is actually derived from what you might call uh, let's say human annotated data, right? So we have annotated the taxonomic class. We have annotated if that's the same individual. So we're actually starting from a, a pretty human centric perception of what is important here. But does this bird agree with us? Now, this is a different bird. And the reason this is a different bird, uh, this is a zebra finch, is this is a, the, a kind of bird that's quite often uh, uh, various uh, research groups work with this in the lab. We could ask him. So we could ask this zebra finch here if the sounds are similar or different. And this is what we've done in a project uh, that's run for the past two years, in fact. Um, we have zebra finches in the lab and we designed a listening test to, to say, uh, is, one bird, is one sound similar to another? So what you see in the picture is that the birds are using a bird feeder just to get some uh, extra seed. And uh, when they do that, they have to solve a little task of is, it, is the correct sound on the left or on the right? show you it in a little bit more detail. Uh, here's the device taken out of the, um, uh, the aviary. And in diagrammatic form, we play sound A and the birds should go to the left. And this is what happens during training. We play sound B, they should go to the right. And then we play mystery sound X. And now the, the question is, which side should they go? So what we can do through that in the bird lab is uh, collect data about decisions, let's call them, their preference-based decisions uh, or similarity-based decisions about uh, which sound uh, is similar to which other sound. And then we treat that as data. So if you want to know if sound X is similar to sound A, well, as we did before, we put it through a neural network and we produce a, a coordinate in this embedding. Um, what we're going to do though, is we're going to train the network not using some classification decision, which is what I told you before. We're actually going to use similarity about whether the bird told us that X was more similar to A or more similar to B. So this is something uh, which is implemented in what we call the loss function. So the loss function is uh, just a part of how we optimize a deep learning algorithm. Instead of the, a loss function, which is about categorizing things, here we have a loss function which says, well, if A is what the birds choose in this example, then we want to push X closer to A and push it further away from B. So during the training of the algorithm, we're shaping this space so that it better reflects um, the bird's perception. So this takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work primarily because it takes months and months to gather enough decisions from the birds to be able to train a deep learning algorithm. Um, but the, the, the results which are in press at the moment are that our neural net agrees with the birds' choices uh, much more often than other audio representations do. So this green line here is a kind of gold standard of, of matching the, the same accuracy as the birds themselves have and our method is outperforming other signal-derived ways of analysing the sound. So what I'm showing you there is a little bit more of how we get more and more precise, and this is, this is partly driven by perceptual and cognitive uh, inspiration, also by the data analysis uh, motivations of wanting to uh, monitor biodiversity in high resolution.
So with credit for that, as I mentioned, Enesh Nolasco is working on the hierarchical embeddings and the perceptual embeddings is a collaboration uh, with many people, but Veronica Morphy is my uh, postdoc who is working on the, the deep learning for the perceptual embeddings. All of this comes together to help us understand animal sound, animal behavior. So we're, it's for scientific purposes as well as for conservation purposes. And sound is fascinating, so it's really interesting work to be doing. So uh, thank you very much.